please welcome Ken Mollis. Okay. I have to, I, do I have to carry this off for John? Do I have to lift this? No, okay, okay. By the way, Laura, I just want to uh, ask you one question. I've been in business for 41 years, and you said 36 of them were successful. So you're going to have to tell me which five I screwed up. Um, I, I don't, uh, there must be something to that message. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. As I walked in, it dawned on me that five years ago, Mollis & Company was the cornerstone investor on the privatization of the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. So it's very good. I, I had never uh, come here before. Um, uh, and then to, it went public. It's been very successful. So it's, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I just wanted to start by saying, you know, Ayn Rand and, and specifically Atlas Shrugged really uh, changed my life. And I thought probably the best way to, to, um, to, to do that is not through, and, and by the way, changed my life to the point where John Allison, when I became a public company, uh, John Allison was the first person I called to become a director of Mollis and Company, and I was very happy when he he took it. You know, the clarity of purpose, our alignment on vision, um, and and every once in a while I called John with difficult issues, and we could talk a little about that, uh, how you deal with the world and the issues out there in a world of uh, Randian um, uh, purpose and and objectivism. But um, I'd just like to bring you through very quickly, because I think it's a story. I've read Atlas Shrugged four times in my life, and it's changed my life four times. So the first time was when I was 17. I think I was 17. I try to remember. It might have been 18 or 16. But, you know, I, I was, um, uh, my brother told me to read the book. He did tell me you could skip the speech part. Um, <laughs> He said, skip that part, it's really boring and it's tough. So when you're 17, I think I actually skipped it the first time. But you know, I was, I was thinking very differently. My father said I used to have fights with him all the time and I'm a, a, a Jewish upbringing, still, I was bar mitzvah and everything, but I had a tough time with religion. I, I used to argue with my father, what's the difference between a religious uh, crutch and drug addiction? It used to drive him crazy. He goes, both have a crutch they lean on, and, and, uh, and they're both mysterious, and, and uh, you know, they're, they're not real. So he, he had enough with me. I think he might have told me to read the book. But um, I had a very difficult time uh, understanding the world. And then I picked up Atlas Shrugged, and for the first time, I was with a, a group of people who, who looked to reason, rational, purpose, who, um, you know, I, I just, at 17, I, don't, I didn't get it all. As I said, I, I didn't read the speech even, just to get through the story. But it affected me and said, I'm not alone. There are people out there questioning, and there are people out there who think differently about what success is and, and what the world was about. Then I took a job, I got out of school, uh, 21, I took a job with a firm called Drexel Burnham, run by Mike Milken. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember that firm. Uh, Mike continues to change the world. Uh, back then, uh, Drexel Burnham was a loser firm, by the way. When I got the job, it was because nobody would take that job. Um, and, uh, and that's true, I'm not just being self-deprecating. Um, so I went out and I took that job and all of a sudden, because of this fellow, Mike Milken, who literally at the time might have been 28 years old, uh, 1981 when I joined, uh, we started to change the world. The way, the way tech is changing the world today is what Drexel Burnham did to finance. And finance was kind of novel. Then everybody did everything the same way. Drexel changed it. They rethought everything. Uh, they, re they changed what you could accomplish. Um, but I'll remember, we were working around the clock. I was working, you know, literally from, you know, morning to night, sleeping under my desk. In those days, I chain smoked um, and all this. And I never forget, I went on vacation uh, a few years later. About, By the way, my early days, just to bring you back to what uh, uh, the introduction was, I was in charge of changing the gaming industry. I'd go to Las Vegas from what they called the Teamsters, which is just a nice way of saying the mafia, to what became um, business people. And uh, I helped Sheldon Adelson buy the sands. I helped Howard Hughes sell the land that became the Mirage. Uh, Howard Hughes, I think, Howard Hughes Estate. Um, and um, that's where I met Steve Wynn and, and later became, uh, tried to help a very brash uh, entrepreneur named Donald Trump through uh, the bankruptcy of three of his casinos. So that's a whole different speech and story. One day maybe with a couple of glasses of wine, we'll talk about that. Um, Anyway, I was working around the clock, and I remember I was on vacation. I know exactly where I was, and I was reading Atlas Shrugged. And I was trying, and I was really thinking about not going through with this job. 
And I got into Atlas Shrug, and I got through that book, and I remember putting the book down and saying, I'm going to do this. I committed to doing it, and it changed my life. I, uh, I I'd stopped questioning it. I knew I had to just be great. I had to be as great as I could be at it. I had to get up every morning, and I, got, and I committed to it. And um, for the next 15 to 20 years, you know, I, I think that's what drove me. It's a tough, tough business at the beginning. Clients want things done immediately, and that really helped me to get there. And I think it drove the success of my business and the way I thought about things. I think the next time I read it was literally 20 years later, I was about 46, 47. I was the president of UBS Investment Bank at this point. I left out some of the uh, how I got there, but I ended up the uh, uh, president of, of UBS Investment Bank, which let's just say I'm not going to say anything bad about UBS today, but at the time I was there, if you don't like bureaucracy, you should try Swiss bureaucracy. Um, it is a very difficult, difficult thing to do. So I'm going to tell you, it's, this is off the record meeting, I hope. Laura, I know you're not going to write anything about this, but this is a true story. So I was getting frustrated at UBS, and I'm on vacation with my wife in Hawaii. We came up with this brilliant idea to merge, I, I, uh, I think Quest, it was a big U.S. Uh, telecom company with Verizon. It was a 15 or $20 billion deal. It was our idea. We were making a $25 million M&A fee. But we had to put up, UBS had to put up $2 billion of capital alongside uh, three, two other firms, Merrill Lynch and Deutsche Bank were also putting up. Anyway, it wasn't that difficult alone. But UBS had undercut me t 10 times in the past. Uh, they just, you know, in the middle of a deal, they had decided to not live up to the... So I said, I'm not going to commit to this deal unless I get the board of directors of UBS to tell me they're not going to reverse on me. And uh, they were like, what, what do you mean? I said, look, I'm not putting my name on this deal. I'm not telling them we're done unless you do it. So I did that in April. Lo and behold, it comes time to close the deal in some time in, uh, I think it was September. And um, uh, the, the company needs $100 million more million to, to win. I'm going to try to keep this simple. But at the end, I get, I get I'm going to call on Friday, and, and, and literally they tell me, you know, we told you that was all we were going to do. We are out of the deal. <laughs> we're going to pull out of the deal on a Friday. I said, you're doing, you're what? You're going to, I mean, this is our idea. We're going to make a $25 million fee. We'll make like, you know, uh, enormous amounts of money. It was, it was the deal of a lifetime. It was, I mean, at that day's $20 billion deal was a big deal. Um, and they had to rebid on Sunday night. So it's Friday. So I stay on them. I stay with them all day on Friday night. I don't know if this is interesting, but it's finances. It, okay, so I was, uh, uh, and I'm reading Atlas Shrugged on the beach with my wife, and I stay on them with five hours. I get them to increase by $100 million, pretty much threatening to quit and, you know, whatever I had to do. Anyway, but they said, whatever you do, do not come back for any more money. Is that a good Swiss accent? I don't know if that's a good Swiss accent, but that is it. You do not come back. Well, I know if you're in M&A and a deal moves on a Friday, there's a 100% chance it's going to move again on Sunday. Before the Monday, somebody's going to rebid, and I'm just waiting for it. And on Sunday morning, I get a call. And, and again, I was in Hawaii on vacation with my wife that uh, we have to move another $100 million. I'm, I, I just can't believe this. But I'm at that part in Atlas Shrugged. Anybody here read it? where Dagny goes and builds the railroad on her own. Everybody remember that part? They, they won't fund her, so she does it on her own. And I'm sitting in a beach chair with my wife. Now, you know, I'm an employee now, so I, you know, I make money, but I don't make that much money. And we get on a call. I get the whole board of directors on this call. And they said, we told you, do not come back. We are out. We will not provide another $100 million loan. We are, I'm on with two hours, so I finally, uh, my wife sitting next to me, I said, all right, I'll tell you what, you're out, right? They said, yes, the whole board, we're out. I said, I'll put up the 100 million. You know, I just, I'm on the page where Dabney does it. I'm feeling my oats. I don't have 100 million dollars, but I said, I'll put up the extra 100 million, but I get the M&A fee, and, uh, and uh, you know, you put up what you've already committed to, and I'll do the 100 million. Uh, and my, and I, I look, my wife's looking over me, goes, what the heck, what, what is, what are you doing? So I said, shh. <laughs> Anyway, this goes on for, you know, another two hours when finally the CFO, this is a true story, the CFO of UBS goes, we're talking about how we're going to do this. And all of a sudden I hear somebody rational say, wait a second, wait a second, we cannot borrow the money from the Molis. How, do, how does UBS borrow the money from the Ken Molis? And uh, I shamed them into doing it. Anyway, I hung up the phone, I looked it out, and I looked at my book, 
And I said, I'm, I'm quitting as soon as I can. And, you know, you talk about moments. Um, it gave me the, you know, I, I quit as soon as I could right after that. That December, I quit. And I set out, and, and if it wasn't for the, you know, I really believe if it wasn't for reading about Dagny Bigley Railroad, I wouldn't have had the conversation. It also convinced me you can't live like this. By the way, UBS is a great firm now. I don't want to say anything bad about it. That was 15 years ago. Different people, just for the record, anybody who's covering this. Um, by the way, UBS almost went bankrupt two years later in the crisis, just so you know, because of bad decision making. Really bad decision making. So um, anyway, I, I, you know, that, that changed my life again. It literally led me to get up and quit. As a result of quitting, I started this firm, Mollison Company, 15 years ago, and it's been the greatest thing I've done, being an entrepreneur for all the entrepreneurs in the room. I, I congratulate you. I had to wait till I was uh, 48 to do it. I'm not really an entrepreneur. I was a chicken. I wasn't really risking my life. I, I would have I made it anyway, so I, I don't know how it's like to be a young entrepreneur and really have that risk. I, my... I really tip my hat to you. And the last time I read it, by the way, was to read it as an entrepreneur in the middle about five years ago, and, and I got completely different um, lessons from it. But um, each time, it gave me something that is just really hard to believe. The, the idea, the five years ago especially, just to be around heroic people who do the things they want to do, who, who don't waver. And you know, I, I, I'll leave one tip that I got out of it in, in running a company, because I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs and business people here. This, uh, this uh, I titled the thing, uh, Check Your Premises. And you know, one of my favorite lines by Rand is that there are no contradictions in life. If you find a contradiction, um, check your premises. One of them is wrong. And, and I think there's so many people who have no premises now. They go into business, they don't have a foundation of beliefs. I see this, and I hate to say it, I'm on the business roundtable, the largest companies in America, and they're being hit by these, what do we do about the Voting Rights Act in Georgia, this law in Texas, the vaccine mandate, and I watch the most uh, ESG, climate change, uh, riots, and do, what, what do we say about the riots here, what do we not say about the riots there? And, and I watch the best, what you consider the, the top CEOs in America, and I just watch them wave in the wind. And I gotta believe their employees and know they're just, they're just putting their finger up in the air and wherever the wind is going, they're, they're going. And it's very, by the way, dis very disappointing. Um, and I've run the firm by a very firm set of beliefs and I think it's, it's essential for every entrepreneur here. Get, get a foundation, understand what your premise is, your employees are watching you, and live by it, and, and people notice, and I think it, it's, it, it drives success. So um, again, congratulations to all of you. Um, uh, Reed Atlas shrugged at least three times, all right? I, you know, I'll, get, I'll let you off for the fourth, but um, uh, do it at least three times. It'll, it'll, it'll result in a very successful business. Thank you.